Thank you so much, Professor Holly, for coming here. Professor John Stratton Holly has done his PhD in Comparative Religion from Harvard University in 1977. He is currently a Claretor Professor of Religion at Barnard College, Columbia University, and he has taught in Colombia since 1986. Some of his recent books include A Storm of Songs, India and the Idea of the Bhakti Movement, Sur's Ocean, on that's on Surda's Songs and Poems, and a newly expanded edition of Surda's Poet, Singer and Saint. Professor Holly also has edited a volume called Bhakti and Power, Social Location and Public Effect in India's Religion of the Heart. And this book is forthcoming in 2019 from University of Washington Press. And this particular book which today we are going to be releasing is known as Krishna's Playground, Brindavan in the 21st Century. And more importantly for us, he has been kind enough to offer his advice on how we could conduct religious studies programs in India. And we at the Bhaktivedanta Research Center are very honored to have his continuous guidance in this regard. And we hope that with the kind of guidance we receive from illustrious professors like yourself, religious studies program in India will become a reality in the near future. Thank you very much. So I now request Professor Holly to share his message with all the devotees. We'll bring this microphone over there. Um, one more. Please be very excited and enthusiastic to hear. And after Professor Jack Holly speaks, we will have another person who came to India in 1970, Shamsundar Prabhu. But he came in a very different circumstance. We know his story. Incredible, unbelievable, amazing, and historical. He met Srila Prabhupada in 1968, January, 1967, 1967 January, that means just after 1966. <laughs> and he was, he started with a few other, with a few other of his friends, he started a temple in Haight-Ashbury and to greet Prabhupada, he arranged that concert, a, 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 like a fundraising concert with the, the biggest bands in America at the time, Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin and all these people. And, and then after that, you know, it's just amazing what happened in Haight-Ashbury. Then he went to London, went to London with nothing. And within a couple months, he was living at John Lennon's house and making records of Hare Krishna Mantra with George Harrison. They became best friends. And then Prabhupada came. They established a temple. And then, Sham, and then Prabhupada asked Shamsundar, let us start the Hare Krishna movement in India. So he came in 1970 and became Srila Prabhupada's personal secretary. And the very seed of our home movement in India, of course, the seeds go back to Krishna 5,000 years ago on oh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago on the six Goswamis and Narottam Das Thakur and all of our Acharyas. But you know, Srila Prabhupada's contribution of taking this movement to the West and then coming back to India. Shamsundra has written a whole book about it entitled Chasing Rhinos with the Swami.
volume one, told in great detail. Intimacy, humor. Some of the stuff he says is shocking. <laughs> Nobody wants to say these things these days, what he said about himself. But it was true. <laughs> he speaks about San Francisco and London. And today he's releasing volume two and it's a very, very incredible, exciting, adventurous book <coughs> all about how the Hare Krishna movement was established in India. So all of you, um, this is so much a part of your life. It will, it will exhilarate your souls if you read it. And another thing is Shamsundar Pru was one of my best friends and he was he's so dear to everyone's heart and he brought several thousand books with him so he has to sell them. <laughs> And I, I humbly request each and every one of you to buy this book and he's going to be sitting all day in a table right outside as soon as this class is over. So please stand in line and get his book. He'll sign it for you and bless you and everything. So I'm just so grateful that these two wonderful personalities both residents of Brindavan for almost 50 years that we could be together. And for these two, let us once again loudly chant Hadi Bolt. <laughs> तो सबसे पहले तो मैं ये कहना चाहता हूँ कि कि इस पूरे सौभाग्य वन साक्षारी के लिए हम तो वास्तव में आभारी हैं कि हाँ ये पहली बार तो नहीं है कि मैं मुंबई में आके हूँ पर ये पहली बार है कि मैं यहाँ पर आया खैर कल रात को मैं आया था संकीर्तन में शामिल होने के लिए और दूर से मैं देख रहा था कि आप सब लोग कैसे संकीर्तन करते हैं ये तो बड़ा सा अनुभव लग गया था हमारे दिल में तो हम तो कृतज्ञ हैं और नीचे मैंने एक बहुत छोटे बच्चे की बात सुन रहा था वो बोल रहा था कि अरे ऊपर तो डांस करते हैं डांस करते हैं ऊपर तो ये सब डांस जो आया था उनके बोली में वो तो शायद उसके बारे में सोचा कि नाच तो नहीं होना चाहिए ये नाच के लिए ब्रिटिश लोगों ने ऐसा सोचा कि नाच तो नहीं होना चाहिए पर ये नाच जो है कितना स्वाभाविक रूप से यहाँ मुंबई में उत्पन्न हो गया है तो ठीक है तो ये तो एक बात है और इस रुके फाइगवान न जाने क्या लग गया था हमारे मन में पर क्या करें ये हिंदुस्तान का प्रभाव है कभी कभी तो न जाने क्या हो सकता है पर जबान तो है वो कुछ क्या बिगड़ हो जाता है और अगर कुछ शब्द निकलते हैं तो न जाने क्या कहेगा तो सबसे पहले तो ये नमस्कार और बिल्कुल क्या धन्यवाद करना चाहते हैं कि मैं यहाँ आया हूँ दूसरी बात यह है कि जैसे कि आपने शुरू कर दिया था अजामल की कहानी में मैं तो कोई एक दो शब्द उसके बारे में कहना चाहता हूँ अगर मैं कह सकता हूँ दो मिनट में और ये मुझको बहुत अच्छी हाँ चीज़ तो दिलाता है हरी बोल जो है मैं तो तो मैं तो हाँ जब मैं वृंदावन में आता था, था हाँ उन्नीस में तो मेरा चेहरा तो आप अच्छी तरह से देख सकते हैं वो कितना गोरा है तो देखिए तो सभी लोग जो वहाँ पर थे आपको मालूम होगा कि प्रभुपाद उन दिनों में आए थे वृंदावन में और हरिकृष्ण लोग सबसे पहले यहाँ आए थे मतलब हमारे वृंदावन में तो हम जैसे आदमी देखकर के वो क्या बोलते थे हरिबोल 
تو میں نے ایسا کہا تھا کہ نہیں نہیں یہاں پر رادھے رادھے کہتے تو ٹھیک ہے تب تو وہ کہنے لگے ہیں کہ ہرے کرشن اور میں بتاتا تھا کہ ارادے رادھے اب تو میں دیکھ رہا ہوں کہ ہری بول تو کہہ سکتے ہیں کوئی بات نہیں ہے دنیا کی اتپتی تو اتنی ہو گئے ہیں کہ ہری بول بھی کہہ سکتے ہیں اور رادھے رادھے بھی کہہ سکتے ہیں ساتھ ساتھ وہ لوگ اس کون والے لوگ اس برنداون میں رہتے تھے اور بڑا سا مندر اور بہت چمکار مندر تو ہونے والا تھا اس دن اور ہمارے سائڈ پہ ہمارے جیسنگیرے میں وہ تو وہاں رادھا رمن جی کا مندر رہتا تھا پرمپراگت روپ سے اب تو میں دیکھ رہا ہوں کہ یہ دونوں سائڈس جو ہیں ایک اسکون کا اور ایک رادھا رمن جی کا وہ تو ایک سمبلن کر رہے ہیں اور سہیوگی کرتے ہیں ہماری دنیا کے لیے تو اگر میں دو شب کہہ سکتے ہوں اس سہیوگی کے بارے میں میں کرتا کیوں گا ہری بول بولتے ہیں Really, I thought I was going to speak in English this whole time. I don't know what came over me. Maybe I should revert. Huh? Please revert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm reverting. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd like to return to what you had to say about Ajamal, if I could, and Nam Kirtan. We've been talking about Hari Bol and Hari Krishna. under the rubric of Nam Sankirtan, which is going on right now. So I would, in, as I listen to you speak, I was thinking about those two words, Nam and Sankirtan. And I was thinking, Radha Nachi, about your own perspective on things. In your beautiful book, you speak about the fact that um, you were also touched by Christianity and many other religious traditions and that you feel the message you have taken in and that you have to give is truly a global message, that it has no intrinsic limits. Well, I share that hope. About Sankirtan there, I would say that uh, the fact that we are a musical species, that we make Kirtan together, Sankirtan. That, that's a phenomenon we should never forget. When we think of Nam Sankirtan, even in the way that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu understood it, we are thinking of something that exceeds the boundaries of any specific religious tradition. My mother was a, an organist. What is an organist? An organist plays the organ. <laughs> This is not, you know, organ donation. It's not that. <laughs> It's a musical instrument. <laughs> so that sense of uh, music as a, a counterplay to the word uh, is, is deep within my own past. There is something about music that exceeds our ability to speak about it and to frame it in words. So I would take it as my father-in-law, who played in the Boston Symphony for 60 years, would say that music is an international language. And whenever we sing, I would hope that we could remember that singing itself is something that goes beyond any words that we might sing. The fact that uh, a child can best be put to sleep by hearing a lullaby. That is one of the great mysteries of our race, that there is something about music that speaks even when we don't know what the words should be. Sankirtan. And then Nam. What's in a name? Shakespeare asked. The first thing that is in a name, I would think, is the very fact of its being a name. We were just speaking about children and the moment of singing a lullaby. There's also that wonderful moment somewhere between the age of one and two when a child learns what her own name is, what his own name is, and learns to be able to speak with, in English, the word I. 
And that's a magical moment when the child, instead of referring to herself as whatever name has been given to her, takes on the, the word I. She's heard this word, of course, from her parents. They speak to her as, I want you to do this, I. Now suddenly she is an I. It's the taking on of that sense of mamata, of I-hood, atmatva, is a very magical moment. But it's also a very dangerous moment because we begin to associate with our I-ness a sense of property ownership that it's really our life's work to try to forget, try to understand that we collectively are I. But the magic of that moment when subjecthood is transferred from a a, a parent to a child, that's a magic that never goes away. I think that when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began the practice of Nam Sankirtan in northern India and eastern India, some of that sense of I was behind it. We spoke with the story of Ajamal. That has, historically speaking, two aspects, I think. One has to do with uh, the, the, the saying of a name throughout India. The Bhagavata Purana was probably composed in the south. Certainly its composer knew of the traditions of the south. And Namsan Kirtan is uh, a, a deep reality in the religious traditions of South India. I suspect that that is being uploaded into the Bhagavata and then made into a national and then international message. But the other thing that was happening at the time when the Lord Chaitanya spread the practice of Namsan Kirtan was the presence of, symbolically, his student Haridas. Haridas came from a Muslim family. I think that the emphasis that the Lord Chaitanya placed on the name had not only to do with its all India character, the fact that it had deep roots in the South, as represented by the story of Adamil, actually, which is well known in the South. It also had to do with his recognition of the fact that the Islamic tradition also takes very seriously the process of naming, to the extent, of course, that there are 99 names for Khuda, and we can choose any of them. I think, historically speaking, that that moment when Nam Sankirtan began to be spread in the course of the early 16th century was a moment in which the, you could say, indigenous traditions of India and the learned traditions of Islam came together in a very remarkable way. I would hope that when we chant the the, the Nam Sankirtan, that we would try to remember the broad meaning that it has in both those ways. Now can I say something about Vrindavan? You've mentioned the name of Sim Krishna Das. There's not time for it, but I brought a file that has been in my academic files for a long time. And at the top of that file, there is a single name. We're speaking about Nam Sangirtan. There's a single name, Asim. So I pulled out that file just as the last act before getting on the plane, because I knew that we would share the memory of Asim together. And, uh, but without looking inside to see what might be there, I didn't have time to do that. I didn't do that until last night. You were busy, poor, poor man, trying to read a few passages from my book. I was busy reading Asim, <laughs> or something about Asim. They took me back to the, min- the mid-1990s. Uh, Asim was just coming up on his 50th birthday. And it's a very different Asim from what we normally think, what you and I might normally think of as Asim. This was Asim, not Asim, the happy-go-lucky guy, Asim, who was always there for you, and he was—he truly was already there. This was Asim in the mode of a scholar. This was Munshi Asim. This was Kayest Asim. 
This was the Asim who was sitting down, taking note after note in the service of the bridge uh, Prakalpa project, which was uh, a Vaishnava project between Natadwara and, and Braj. He was deeply involved in it, and he needed some money, actually, to be able to continue it. So he was applying for funds to the Smithsonian and, um, and the Ful Fulbright program, and he needed recommendations, and that was why he had turned back to me and to others, and he couldn't locate his other PhD advisor, Ted Riccardi, because you could never find Ted. And poor Barbara Miller had recently passed away, his other advisor, so he was turning to me and some others, to David Haberman too, as a matter of fact, David. Um, so it was an Asim who was trying to uh, do the real thing, actually, looking for funds and wondering how to do it. But that spirit of Asim came through the letters very much. So I might, I could read one small passage from Asim, or maybe we could save that for a chance to talk together. Let me just say this, that, uh, that the memory of Asim is a, a wonderfully complex memory. Oh, let me, let me just show you something. Okay, one moment. So here's part of what my Asim file looks like. Oh, I love this, okay. Most of the correspondence I have from Asim is in the form of the blue aerogram. Do you remember the blue aerogram? About this big? When Asim would write an aerogram, we we'll get it in New York, we knew it was from Asim before we even opened it because Asim always had too many words for whatever space he had. So when he would send a typewritten letter, it would look like this. <laughs> The computer forces him to observe the margin on the left, <laughs> okay. But then he chooses the smallest possible type and fits in as many words as he possibly can. And when he comes to the bottom of the page, poor guy, he, he knows, again, the computer is, is monitoring his, his verbiage. So he knows he has to stop, but he's not ready to stop, no, instead, he writes a note at the bottom in his own beautiful handwriting just to make I sure I know what's going on to our, with our common friends. And then that's really not quite enough so he wouldn't feel bad about going to the other margin and filling that up as well. <laughs> and finally, when he comes to the end of the page, he says, Saprem Asim Krishnadas, yours with love, the limitless, the servant of the limitless Krishna, Asim Krishna Das. He has a beautiful name, Asim, beyond any boundary, just as I've been trying to urge that we all remember. So this is a sample of the thinking of Asim Krishna Das. And Radhanachi, you've written a great deal about the phenomenon of miracles and Chumatkari uh, Bhate. At one point in this correspondence, which is an academic, a sort of business correspondence, still Asim can't prevent himself. And he says, you know, he's saying about the fact that he needs this grant. He says, oh, it would be a miracle if it came through. Then he stops and says, well, from one perspective, my whole life is a miracle. I think you may have been talking with him. <laughs> so, let me return to Vrindavan and then to Asim. About Vrindavan, I appreciate very much what you've said about pollution and the challenges that are before us for Vrindavan. The book I've tried to write, uh, I felt I had to write because I had been looking away from what's been happening in Vrindavan at the point where uh, Prabhupada established the Iskan temple in Vrindavan, that temple was in Raman Reti, and there was still some Reti there. Huh. Vrindavan was still a bit of a van. But that van and that Reti in Vrindavan are now in the process of being almost completely destroyed. Iskan, the, the 
the Sri Krishna Balaram temple is now in the geographical center of Vrindavan. And beyond that temple is a vast real estate development which looks far more like Gurgaon than it does like Vrindavan. What is happening in our species that this is the case? Okay, it has to do with neoliberalism, it has to do with development, it has to do with the fact that old boundaries are gone. Vrindavan is now an international place. It has to do with the fact that people have money and they want to invest that money in being in Vrindavan. But what it means is that the natural resources that have kept Vrindavan, Vrindavan all these years are fast disappearing. Not one drop of the Yamanaji arrives in Vrindavan actually today. Not one drop. It is all supplied through a system of access to other rivers or through pollution. No single pavitra drop of that water actually arrives in Vrindavan. The peacocks are rarely seen in the old town. Who is the vahana of Yamanaji? Kurva, hena? Kachwa. Only in the monsoons do we see turtles in the Yamana anymore. That is how serious the matter is. So I know that many of you, especially the young of you, have incredible technological skills. We need those skills in Vrindavan. We need to know how to do what you've done in the Govardhan Echo Village, how to apply that knowledge to Vrindavan so that the water can once again be pure. I don't know how to do it. I just know that unless it is done, we can say goodbye to any historic Vrindavan. It will just be Garbnakibat. I hope that moment doesn't come. And the other thing I would pray for you to think about is the following. As you look across from Vrindavan to the other side of the Yamana, you see the most beautiful space. You see an alluvial river plain where it is still green and where there is no building at all. There are the old villages like Mont, for example. There are the old villages, but aside from that, there is nothing. I guarantee you that unless we take some action collectively, that will not be the case in another 10 or 20 years. We will be looking across the Yamuna, and what will we see? New Jersey. Sorry, I speak as a New Yorker. That beautiful other side of the river will be buildings. It will be parking lots. It will be Ferris wheels. It will be theme parks. It will be whatever anyone wants to build, because people think building is a great thing. If we could please collectively find the courage to landmark that other side of the Yamana, so that its beautiful mirror of the built Vrindavan will not be lost, then we would have done something in our own generation that is our calling to do. If we don't do it, it won't be able to be done, and it will require massive cooperation from all levels of government and from private citizens of some influence, such as yourselves. If you could think about that problem with me, I would be very grateful. And now finally back to Asim. I'm a Jake Bakaka Bandara Hundi. Natani is make the humper. Bakawa had for a hat of good cheese. The Manikana Chatahun Oganaho. <laughs> you would know that um, in, if you go to the Matra Museum, which I very much recommend, you will be greeted by a kind of Dwarapal. And he comes from the Kushana period. So almost two millennia ago, Kanishk, 
He came from Central Asia. And by the way, in the time of Kanishka, we have the Heliodorus pillar, so-called, but it's actually a Bhagavata pillar. The Bhagavata religion was alive at that time. So Kanishka. I came to Vrindavan with something. Sorry, this is Bombay. I came to Mumbai with something in my hand, but I didn't have a package to give it in. So I went down the street to see if a jeweler perhaps could give me a little box to put this thing in. I walked into the, na- the jeweler's shop that is called Tanishka. Oh, oh. <laughs> then I started explaining about Kanishka and the Mathura Museum, and believe me, people turned away in unbelief. So it's called Tanishka. I think it's called Tanishka because it has something to do with the body, Tan, our physical state, and something to do with Ishk. Tan Ishk. But it also carries the memory of Kanishk. So in this box, I would like to offer you something that came to me through no merit of my own. When Robin Beach passed away, she gave me a gift. And it was a gift from Asim. Something from Asim that I would now like to give. This is the dia that Asim used in his um, daily puja of Thakurji. It comes from his little um, chatri up on the roof of Radharaman. He had very little, and the littleness of that dia is a kind of symbol of the little that he had. But he was a great soul in his body. Oh. I hope you like it. So now we request uh, all the devotees to witness the release of the beautiful book, Krishna's Playground, Vrindavan in the 21st century, His Holiness Lokanath Swami Maharaj, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj, Shamsundar Prabhu and Professor Holly, you can at this moment please release the book for the pleasure of the devotees. Haribo! Thank you so much, Professor Holly, for sharing your beautiful realizations. And now we request His Grace Sham Sundar Prabhu. RG Media YouTube channel. Like, share, subscribe.